Okay, so um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to people all over the world. Um, my name is Yang, and I will be chairing today's webinar session. So um, it is our great pleasure today to have Professor Kevin O'Rook here with us. So um, before we start, I will just do a brief introduction. Um, Professor O'Rook is currently Professor of Economics at the New York University, Abtabi, and he will be moving to uh, Science Po Paris in September. Um, he was previously the Cicelli Professor of Economic History at the University of Oxford and a Fellow of All Sorts College. And he's also a member of the Royal Irish Academy, a Fellow of the British Academy, and a former research, uh, research director of the Centre for Economic Policy Research. Um, Kevin's research lies at the interaction of economic history and international economics. He has uh, been publishing extensively on the history of globalization uh, and deglobalization. And his book includes the prize winning Globalization and History, co authored with Jeffrey Williamson, and Power and Plenty Trade, War, and uh, World Economy in the Second Millennium. So today, um, Professor Rook will be uh, talking about his research, The Empire Project Trade Policy uh, in Interwar Canada. And uh, before we start, let me let me also introduce our panelists here today. So first, we have uh, Professor Stephen Broberry, who will be the discussion for Kevin's talk. So Steve is a professor of fellow and a uh, professor of economic history at the University of Oxford, and he's also a leading expert in British and global economic history. And also, we have uh, our panelists here, Professor Debbie Ma, who is also from the University of, University of Oxford, who will be later on also joining the discussion. And uh, so just for the uh, logistics, uh, Kevin's talk will run roughly about an hour, and then uh, we have 15 minutes for discussion between Kevin and Steve. And for the rest of the time, uh, if we have any questions from our online audience, uh, I will just uh, read them out to our speaker here. So if we have any questions later on, you can leave them in a Q&A session. Right, so without further ado, uh, I will now just uh, mute myself and hand it over the stage to you, Kevin. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, then I'll begin. Okay, so thanks very much, Siang, for the introduction and thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me uh, to give this uh, seminar. Um, so as you can see, this is uh, a joint work with Marcus Lampa, who's been my co-author now for many years on a series of papers that I'll talk more about uh, in a little while. Um, with Lawrence Reiter, who uh, was a graduate student uh, at Marcus's institution, and with Yotto Yotto, who is a trade economist, who was brought on board to solve some tricky technical problems that we've been facing throughout uh, our collaboration, me and Marcus. So he came up with a solution that I'll, I'll talk more about uh, later. Um, so the paper is uh, called The Empire Project. Um, and the Empire Project is, um, well, it's, 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 it's taken from, from Adam Smith, who said a long time ago, as you can see there, that you know, the British Empire was only an imaginary one. It wasn't an empire, but the project of an empire, not a gold mine, but the project of a gold mine. There had, now, and as you know, Adam Smith wasn't the, the, the biggest fan of, 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 of the mercantilist apparatus of his uh, day. I mean, that was, I suppose, uh, imperial economic policy of a sort. But uh, if the British Empire didn't really exist in his day, then it certainly didn't exist, economically speaking, by the middle of the 19th century, when Britain moves unilaterally to free trade. And basically, the British Empire also moves to, to, to free trade, certainly the dependent colonies uh, do. And there is no uh, attempt to shape trade flows within the empire uh, to sort of concentrate trade flows within the empire at the expense of the rest of the world, as there have been uh, in Smith's uh, time. Now, there were always people in Britain who thought that this was a shame. There were always people who wanted to make the British Empire uh, not just a collection of territories, but some sort of a cohesive economic unit and who wanted to use activist policies to, to help to bring that about. Uh, people like Joseph Chamberlain, for example, in the late 19th century, whom I'll talk more about uh, later on. But they were always uh, stymied by the fact that Britain's commitment to free trade was unilateral. 
uh, and it was multilateral. Uh, they had uh, free trade with everybody. Uh, they didn't impose tariffs on anybody. And if you don't impose tariffs on anybody, then you can't uh, impose lower tariffs on your imperial possessions than on anybody else because tariffs for everybody are, are zero. Uh, so that was a problem that would be uh, imperialists faced when, when trying to make some sort of a preferential trade zone out of the British Empire. And that's how it was for many, many decades. But then in the 1930s, everything changes and it changes everywhere because of the Great Depression. And um, uh, even in a, a free trade bastion like Britain, resistance to protection is finally overcome and the British start to raise tariffs in 1931 and 1932. And of course, once they start raising tariffs, that then makes possible the, you know, this, this old imperial project of having lower tariffs on your imperial possessions then on the rest of the world, of making uh, the British Empire some kind of a preferential uh, free trade area of some sort. Uh, and so in 1932, uh, Britain, the Dominions, uh, and India, which has a sort of special status at this uh, stage, they all meet in, in Canada, in, in Ottawa, uh, with the hope of bringing about some sort of a, an imperial preferential trading arrangement of some sort. As you can see there, Bennett, uh, or B. Bennett, the, the Canadian Prime Minister, welcoming there, you know, he says, you know, we're finally going to be able to fulfill our long-time hope of real and helpful closer empire economic association. Uh, he's a conservative. Conservatives have always been in favour of the imperial uh, connection. Um, and so he's in favour of this. He says it's in our common interest to achieve a plan that will provide the maximum exchange of goods, but there is a but, compatible with those domestic considerations fundamental to the development of our natural resources. Because you know, he's conservative, which means in the context of the 19th century, he's also a protectionist. He wants to develop industry and so on. And so he cautions that those domestic considerations can't be forgotten if the empire project is to succeed. Okay. Um, this is not a paper about Britain, it's a paper about the host country at Ottawa, Canada. Uh, a lot of things are going on in terms of Canadian trade policy in the interwar period. So it, at the Imperial Conference in Ottawa in 1932, they do in fact sign several preferential trade deals with the UK and with other dominions. So number one, they're deepening their ties with the rest of the empire at the expense of their trading partners in the rest of the world. Number two, they had already been uh, retaliating against the American Holly Smoot tariff since 1930. So they're discriminating against America. And with imperial preference, they're going to be increasingly discriminating against uh, Canada's largest trading partner at the time, which is the United States. Um, and number three, uh, Bennett's domestic considerations also implied a rise in protection affecting all trade partners across the board, both in the empire and outside the empire. So there's a general rise in protection, there's deepening preferences vis-a-vis -vis the empire, there's deepening discrimination uh, against the United States. And so what we try to do in this paper is we provide a detailed quantitative impact uh, account of the impact on Canadian imports of all of these shifts in trade po policy simultaneously. Okay, so that's 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 the agenda. And um, so, what do we do? Uh, we provide a new data set, uh, which is a comprehensive data set on the universe of Canadian imports between 1924 and 1926. So we capture all Canadian imports during those 13 years. Uh, to do that, we digitized, you know, over 7,000 pages of detailed trade and tariff statistics, which I'll talk about uh, later on. Uh, we're able to uh, classify the universe of Canadian imports into uh, imports of 1,693 goods that are consistently defined across time. So that took quite a lot of work, as I'll explain in a moment, because like every other country, Canadian trade statistics at this period, you know, they have classifications across goods, but those classifications aren't consistent over time. And so we had to look across years and merge to the finest level that we could that was consistently defined across time. And those, those, those imports are coming from 112 consistently defined countries or territories. Um, and 
what I think is, you know, an impressive feature of, well, not just our research efforts, but of the Canadian import statistics is that when we do that, when we add up our imports of our, you know, almost 1700 goods from our 112 countries, when we add those disaggregated statistics up, we uh, match the figures for total Canadian imports, which are separately stated in different tables, we match them to the dollar. You know, so our data are 100% accurate, basically, which is which is cool. So those data are available for, for researchers to use for their own purposes. We then use those data to estimate trade elasticities, which I'll talk more about later. Uh, and we allow those trade elasticities to vary across sectors, across trade partners, and across years. If you were a trade economist, you would find that very interesting because trade economists are very interested in, in, in trade elasticities. And um, uh, again, of interest to trade economists, maybe less so to, to economic historians, we are able to do so in a theory consistent manner. And there's a problem that we face in doing things in a theory consistent manner, which is we only have data on imports into one country. And uh, if you do that, if you don't have data uh, on imports into many, many countries, uh, then the standard methods that people use to control for multilateral resistance terms, which I'll talk about, uh, those standard methods don't work. And so we have to uh, come up with a new method, which is what Yotlo did. And I'll talk about that also. Finally, you know, we're not interested in elasticities as economic historians, we're interested in telling stories, we're interested in impacts of policy changes and so on. So what we do is we embed those elasticities into a small open economy model of the Canadian economy at this period, which has an ultra simple supply side, but a very, very detailed model of Canadian import demand corresponding to our very disaggregated trade data. And uh, when we do that, we can then calculate the impact of tariff changes on imports of all of our 1700 goods from all of our destinations over uh, 13 uh, years. Okay, so so that's that's what's on the agenda. Um, it's part of a bigger project, and I just want to take a couple of minutes to, to say something about that, to advertise our wares. So myself and, and Marcus have been working on the impact of interwar trade policy on trade flows for many years now. You'll see why it takes so long when I discuss what we did for this uh, paper. Um, Everybody knows that there was a lot of protection after the Great Depression, and everybody believes that this was disastrous and it had a big effect on trade flows, a big negative effect on, on trade flows. And curiously enough, or ironically enough maybe, uh, when early uh, cleometric attempts were made to quantify the impact of trade policy and trade flows during the 1930s, they came up with very small numbers. They found that trade policy basically didn't matter very much. Now, what those early papers did was they ran gravity uh, equations, which I'll say more about, which you're probably familiar with anyway, but these were pre-structural gravity equations. They didn't incorporate all the new theoretical uh, innovations that were made in the, in, in, in the early years of this century. And they use aggregate uh, trade flows, so total imports rather than imports disaggregated by commodity. And when they were looking at the impact of policy, they would just say, you know, we have a tariff dummy that switches on in, in 1931 or something, or maybe we have an average tariff that is tariff revenues divided by uh, the value of imports. Or if we're looking at the impact of belonging to an imperial trade block, we just have a dummy that switches on in the year that you join the trade block. So it was very, very aggregated uh, data on both the trade flows and the trade policies. What we do, is we look at disaggregated data on both trade flows and trade policies. And I thought that this would be a good idea because Marcus Slampa in his dissertation uh, looked at the impact of uh, joining the network of free trade treaties after the Coven Chevalier Treaty of, of 1860. Uh, again, uh, uh, people had looked at the impact of joining this network of free trade deals using these crude techniques, aggregate trade data, uh, uh, free trade block dummies, this kind of thing, they found very small effects. What Marcus did is he looked at the impact, he looked at actually what did joining one of these free trade deals mean for the tariff on wheat, for example. And then he looked at what, you know, what was the impact then on trade in wheat? 
and he found that there were big effects. So I thought, well, why don't we do this for the interwar period? So, so that's where our collab collaboration comes from. So uh, it's been taking an awful long time, but at this stage, we're, I think, advancing along a fairly broad front. So we had an early paper come out in 2019 uh, looking at the impact uh, of British protection on, on, on UK imports. And we found that actually, when you do things correctly, you find that British protection had a big impact on, on the total value of imports and especially on the geographical composition of UK imports. Uh, they, you know, they, they increased the share of imports coming from the empire uh, quite a bit. Uh, in a recent paper just came out in the EJ, we have a similar paper for India. Again, we found that Indian protection boosted UK exports to India substantially. We found that Japan was the big loser. That seems to be a common theme running through a lot of our work. Uh, we have a, a paper coming out with Pim de Zwart uh, in the EHR looking at protection in the Netherlands and Dutch East Indies and we're, we're doing a follow-up paper sort of as we speak. Um, we have a paper came out with Chris Michener and Kirsten Wanschneider in the EJ uh, using slightly different methods uh, to look at the, uh, uh, the impact of, of countries' retaliation against the US Holly Smoot tariff and, and we found that basically on average this, the impact of retaliating against the Americans after 1930 was, was big, at the order around 30%. Um, we have some papers looking at not the impact of policy, but just looking at the structure of import collapses in the UK and in Asia. And that was, I suppose, inspired by a similar literature that trade economists have been producing in the aftermath of the great trade collapse of 2008. They were interested in the structure of the trade collapse. That's interesting. It, it can inform you about the causes of the of the trade collapse. So we sort of basically replicated those analyses with historical data for the 1930s. And when I was at Oxford, I had a student who did his PhD on Germany using the data that we had uh, collected. And finally, we have got a couple of ongoing papers on, on East Asia. And I really wish that I had been able to talk about these but uh, the, the, the work is still ongoing there's one with keller and shu on china we're looking at what happens when they regain tariff autonomy which seems like an interesting thing to, to look at and we have another paper on japan that's ongoing with okubo and, and yato where uh, we're looking at the impact of, of of japanese protection in the 1920s and 1930s and and there will be more to come as well so i feel like we're we're making progress and and uh hopefully by the time i retire it'll be, it'll be all be done you know so so that's the the broad agenda but back to back to canada we're looking at the impact of protection in canada in the 1920s and especially in 1930s uh we think the paper speaks to uh several uh relevant literatures so there is this 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 literature first of all on interwar trade blocks that i've already mentioned uh, the early stuff that found small effects, the more recent stuff that we've contributed to that finds bigger effects. There is a, a literature on retaliation against smooth haulage to which we've contributed. Um, very little quantitative work on that. Uh, Irwin has a back of the envelope calculation for Canada, partial equilibrium thing. He finds a big effect of retaliation uh, on Canadian imports from the US. We, we find smaller impacts, in fact. I'll talk about that. Um, there is a trade literature on the impact of, of colonial ties on trade between former and current colonies, you know, maybe of interest to, to Hong Kong, although I guess you know, a different sort of colony, being, a, being an entrepot. Um, so, you know, what Head and, and, and Meyer and Rees found was that you know, there are these colonial trade links, but that they, they deteriorate, they degrade slowly over time after independence but before independence they're pretty small they're pretty big sorry um they they basically interpreted their results by suggesting that they show that how empires boost trade is by creating trading capital networks of traders who know each other and that that's what mean that's what explains why you know canadians and brits have a higher proportion to trade with each other it's all of these links that have been created over many many uh, decades and that you know these links are what is deteriorating gradually after independence. Well, we, you know, uh, have results that speak to the extent to which trade policy could have been responsible for, you know, a disproportionate uh, tendency, for example, 
uh, for Canadians to import from, from Britain. Uh, there's also um, a more recent literature in international trade looking at, uh, well, the impact of trade blocks on trade between trade block partners, but, but looking specifically at whether these trade blocks have heterogeneous impacts on participants. You know, so the standard literature said, you know, we have you know, on the left hand side of our regression, we're looking at whether countries A, I and J are trading with each other uh, more than they should be in some sense based on their size and so on. And then on the right hand side, you have do I and J uh, become members of some sort of a, a trade block. And so you estimate some sort of an average trade block effect, which can be big or small. And what Bayer et al did is they say, well, maybe this effect varies across trade blocks and maybe it varies across participants. Um, and maybe this is because uh, the trade elasticities that matter uh, for the impact of trade block membership on trade, maybe those elasticities are heterogeneous uh, across trade partners. Well, what we think is that joining a trade block could have heterogeneous effects on trade partners, not because the relevant elasticities are different, but because the actual trade policy shocks involved, the tariff changes involved are, are different across participants. Uh, you know, because you don't just, you know, the legislation doesn't say we're now joining a trade block, right? The legislation looks at, you know, what's gonna to happen to tariffs and wheat and cars and all sorts of other things. And those shocks themselves can differ across participants. And obviously you can only address that issue if you have disaggregated data on trade and trade policy, and that's what we have. And so we can speak to that, okay. And finally, there's a, just a simply enormous literature in international trade and trade elasticities, um, which I won't go into. So we contribute to that, obviously, also. Okay, uh, okay, I'm doing okay for time. So I wanna begin by saying something about Canadian trade policy, because you may not know very much about the history of Canadian trade policy. So essentially they were always raw material exporters and they traditionally had a privileged position in the British market uh, to which they exported timber and wheat. And then what happens is that in 1846, Britain moves, as I mentioned earlier, to more or less multilateral free trade. So that wipes out their preferences in the British market, which means that they're now potentially very exposed to, for example, timber exports from the Baltic uh, or competition from grain exports from, you know, continental Europe or whatever. And so Canadian trade policymakers from mid-century on are very interested in getting a privileged position from themselves, either in the British market or in the American market. For some reason, this policy, when it applies to Britain, is known as looking for preferences. And when it applies to the United States, they talk about looking for reciprocity. So they're looking for special deals in these markets for the raw material exports, while simultaneously, they're also very interested in protecting uh, uh, their nascent manufacturing sector that's facing competition from precisely those two countries, Britain and America. So it's a kind of complicated thing being a Canadian trade negotiator. You're looking for special deals in these markets and then you're simultaneously trying to protect yourself against man manufacturing exports from those same countries. So anyway, good luck with that. Um, they eventually moved to import substitution wholesale in 1878 uh, under the Conservatives. And this becomes a bipartisan policy. It becomes increasingly sophisticated over time. For example, the world's first anti-dumping duty uh, was a, a Canadian invention in 1904. You know, whoever said Canadian economic history is boring, very exciting, obviously. So that's the first big shift. They moved to import in, uh, uh, com industri import competing industrialization, uh, import substituting industrialization. Second big shift in 1898, they, they uh, unilaterally extend tariff preferences to the UK and a couple of other colonies. And eventually they're extending tariff preferences to the whole empire, although it comes with a bit of a lag. For some reason, Newfoundland only gets uh, tariff preferences in 1928, you know, and the Australians get it even later. But, uh, but basically they're discriminating in favor of the empire and against the rest of the world. And they're doing so unilaterally without any expectation of reciprocal preferences from Britain or, or anybody else. Thirdly, um, they are becoming increasingly politically independent of London. And what this means is that they can eventually start running their own uh, independent trade policy. And so they use that flexibility to do trade deals with other countries, for example, France. And so uh, by in 1907, they introduced a third 
tariff schedule. So there's the, the preferential tariff schedule, which is the preferential tariffs they impose on imports from Britain and the empire. There is a general tariff schedule applying to countries with no sorts of preferences whatsoever. And then from 1907 on, they have a third intermediary or treaty rate schedule for countries like France that aren't in the empire, but they did do a treaty, trade deal with them. So they have these three tariff schedules and they continue to apply into our period in the 1930s that we're looking at. So there's the war, you know, tariff rates go up and then inflation erodes them during the war. Um, and, and basically policy is fairly stable during the 1920s. But then everything changes after the Great Depression. Um, so the first thing that happens is uh, they, 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 they retaliate against the Holy Smoot tariff and actually they retaliate even before Holy Smoot is enacted. So those of you who know your trade policy history will know that Holy Smoot comes in in June of 1930, but the Canadians are already retaliating against it uh, the month before. Uh, they, they put on uh, countervailing duties on, uh, on a multilateral basis, but on goods that are of particular interest to the Americans. Uh, so, and on the other hand, they lower their preferential tariffs on British goods, you know, on 27, on 270 goods, sorry, coming in from, 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 from the British Empire. Now, it's the liberals who are doing this. They tend to be more free trade. They tend to be less imperialistic, but they're doing this anyway because they've got an election coming up and they want to steal the Conservatives' thunder. It doesn't work. The Conservatives come to power in July. They raise tariffs even more, uh, especially on goods coming from, from outside the empire. Uh, they uh, increase anti-dumping duties. Uh, they, they have a general import surcharge of, I think, 3% for fiscal purposes, because you know, it's the Great Depression, they need ta ta tax revenue. And they also, this is a Canadian thing, they play around with the valuation of the imports. You know, so the merchant says the good is coming in at you know, $2 per kilo, and they say, well, no, actually, we think it should be $3 per kilo. And if you have a, an ad valorem tariff, that will obviously increase the tariff revenue that you, you raise. So, so they, they, they are very, basically pretty protectionist across the board, and they're increasingly discriminating against the Americans and other non-British countries. So that's what happens in, in the summer of 1930 and the spring of 31. In the autumn of 31, things get even more interesting. So Britain leaves gold, first of all. Uh, Pound sterling depreciates. That makes British exports more competitive. And so the Canadians retaliate by imposing an anti-dumping duty on the British. So they like the empire, but they're gonna retaliate against the Brits anyway. And they also use the old pre-devaluation exchange rate to value British imports on. The British don't like that, of course. Um, the following month the, in Britain again, uh, there's a national government comes to power. It's dominated by conservatives. The conservatives are protectionist because they're conservative, right? And they're also imperialist because they're conservative. And so they impose tariffs and they uh, temporarily exempt the dominions, the, the Canadians, Americans, or Australians, etc., from these tariff increases. And they exempt these dominions from these tariff increases temporarily pending the outcome of the Imperial Economic Conference to be held in Ottawa in July of the following year. Uh, and so the Brits are hoping for a, a satisfactory negotiation there that will see everybody extend preferences to, to everybody. And so the fact that these tariffs are only temporarily withheld and that if they don't, uh, if there isn't a satisfactory outcome in Ottawa, uh, the Dominions will then face the tariffs in, in, the, in the autumn of 1932. You know, that fact gives the Brits some negotiating uh, weight that they hope to use to their advantage in these negotiations in Ottawa, whether they succeed or not, we'll see in a moment. Yeah, so there, there are deals done in Ottawa in the summer of 1932. Canada does free trade deals with, with the UK, with the Irish Free State, which is still theoretically a dominion, uh, with South Africa and with Southern Rhodesia. And they'd earlier struck deals with Australia and New Zealand. So they basically do bilateral deals with all of the dominions. Um, the British deal, for example, involves lowering tariffs on British goods and raising tariffs on non-British goods, right? So the Brits aren't just looking for lower tariffs into the Canadian market. They want foreign countries 
to be hit with higher tariffs to raise the margin of preference. And as we'll see, it's the, that margin of preference that is actually important when looking at the trade impact of all of this. Um, Canada promises to extend its British preferences to the colonies. There's some debate about whether they did that or not. And then they, um, they promised that all of these fiscal surcharges on imports from the UK shall be abolished as soon as the finances of Canada will allow. Yeah. And they promised to give sympathetic consideration to the possibility of reducing and even ultimately abolishing the exchange dumping duty insofar as it applies to imports from the United Kingdom. So, so trade deals then were like trade deals now. They have a lot of diplomatic language that means very little. Uh, in practice. And as you can imagine, not everybody was uh, overawed by the negotiating prowess of, of, of the British uh, uh, trade delegation in, in Ottawa. They don't always do a good job of negotiating trade deals, the Brits uh, said. But anyway, I'll, uh, I won't comment on present uh, attempts. So that's all going on. And then finally, uh, in 1935, uh, the final major change in, in Canadian trade policy we want to look at. They, they strike a trade deal with the US and for the first time ever, they accord the US most favored nation status. And that comes into effect in 1936, which is the last year of our data set. Okay, so we want to look at the impact of all of these changes in policy on Canadian imports. So uh, how do we do that? So first of all, we're interested in what was the impact of the changes in Canadian trade policy after 1929? So what we do is we construct a model of the Canadian economy in 1929 that has a very detailed treatment of import demand. And we say, what would imports have been like in 1929 if tariffs had been set in 1929, not at the 1929 levels, but at the 1930 levels, the 1931 levels, the 1932 levels? What would that have done to the structure and, and, and total level of Canadian imports in 1929? So for that, we need a 1929 model of the Canadian economy. So that's the first set of questions we ask. Secondly, we say, well, what's the impact of the entire structure of Canadian protection over our whole period? And so to answer that question, we construct similar models of the Canadian economy for each of our years, 24 to 36. And then for each year we ask, well, what would imports have been like in those years if tariffs had been set to zero? Okay, so that's what we do. Uh, in order to answer these questions satisfactorily, we want there to be a substitution in our model between Canadian consumption of domestic goods and imports, between different types of imports, different goods, and between different national varieties of imported goods. And, and we can do that given our data. So what does the sort of canonical model look like? On the supply side, basically for data reasons, because we don't have very much supply side data, we have GDP and precious little else, uh, we have an ultra simple model where the Canadian uh, um, representative household is endowed with a factor of production, which we call GDP. And then there's a single production sector, a constant elasticity of transformation production sector that, that transforms this GDP into either domestic output, which is, con which is tr consumed domestically, it's a non-traded good, or exports, okay? So there's an elasticity of transformation there. So you will switch between producing more or less of these two goods, depending on their relative price. You know, the, there's an elasticity that governs the elasticity of that price response. Um, the exports are just exported. They're used to uh, earn foreign exchange and the foreign exchange is used to uh, pay for your imports and, and trade is balanced. So that's the supply side. On the demand side, we have our representative consumer with a nested CES utility function. So at the top level here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, uh, you're trading off between domestic output and imports. You know, you could, you, could, you could consume the domestic stuff or you could consume imports. Okay, now let's imagine that we're consuming imports. Well, you could consume, you could consume good one or good two, or you could consume good 1,693, okay? You could consume any one of these goods and there's a, elasticity of substitution gamma that, that governs those trade-offs, okay? Okay, now we're consuming good one, let's call it cars. Okay, are we gonna consume British cars or American cars? And there's gonna be an elasticity of substitution sigma that's gonna govern that choice between different national varieties 
of the same good. Okay, so and those are those those elasticities here are ones that we can estimate very accurately, and they're going to be very important in terms of explaining the share of imports coming from different countries. We're going to assume that Canada is a small open economy, so it takes the world prices of good G coming from country C in year T. We take that as given, and then the domestic price is simply going to be equal to the world price times one plus the tariff rate. You know where that that's the ad valorem tariff equivalent. Um, and so what we do is, you know, we, we know what this is in, in the benchmark, actually. And so we construct models that replicate the benchmark. And then we can then say, well, what if, for example, that tariff rate had been zero? And we can see what the, how the whole system of imports would have changed in this counterfactual scenario. What's nice about nested CES means that if you know all of the consumption flows, so all of our imports from all of our countries and domestic output, if you know the tariff wedges, which we have, and if you know the elasticities, which we estimate or assume, if you have all that information, then all of the parameters of this utility function can be, can be recuperated. So, so, so there's no problem in, in parameterizing this uh, utility function. Um, as I say, those are going to be crucial, those elasticities, for the direction of trade. And we're going to estimate those using our disaggregated data on trade and trade policy. The top level utility, if you think about it, is going to matter a lot for the total value of imports. You know, tariffs go up, the price of imports goes up. We're going to substitute away from imports towards domestic output. How much do you do that? That's going to depend largely on kappa. We don't have a lot of data on that uh, to estimate this. You know, we, we have data for on basically consumption of domestic output and of imports. And we have for tariff levels for a panel of countries for annual aggregate data. So when we do that, we get a, a value for kappa of 3.3 you know, with a standard error of 0.5, as you can see. So it's statistically significant, which is cool, but that standard error is, is relatively big and that's gonna matter for, for the accuracy of our results as I'll explain later, later on, okay? This matters in general, but it actually doesn't matter quantitatively very much. We just assume Cobb-Douglas and we do sensitivity analysis and yeah, and this elasticity here doesn't seem to matter very much. We just grab the value from the literature. Okay, our data. Okay, I think I've said a lot of this already, so I'll, I'll be brief, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we, we end up with 1697 products um, of which we drop four uh, because, you know, for various idiosyncratic regions. Um, and yeah, and we can, we can, we can then divide our our data on our imports of 1693 goods into 10 broad sectors. That's coming from the Canadian trade statistics and 99 industries. That's already also, that's also coming, those classifications from the Canadian trade statistics. And this is what the data looked like. So we, we digitized 7,000 plus of these, these data, okay? So what you can see is here we have walnuts uh, shelled. We have the total amount uh, in pounds. So that's nice. So for this, we could, we could compute a unit value and we have the value of the walnuts and we have the duty paid on walnuts, right? So that's going to give us our, our, our tariff rate on imports of walnuts from the USA, okay? Um, so this is pretty finely disaggregated. And um, when you digitize these things, you know, there's a bit of OCR, there's a bit of typing, there's going to be typos. We were able to completely eliminate these for two reasons. Firstly, as you can see, this, this table gives you data, not just for 1932, but for the previous three years. So you can compare that way and catch out lots of typos. And then secondly, it's, you know, here we have all other nuts, nuts shelled coming in from all of our countries. And what you can see is it gives it to you by, by trade partner. And it also then gives it for the total. And again, you can compare, you can add up these things, see if you get the right total. And again, you'll catch lots of typos that way. And so we basically eliminate it all uh, typos. Um, now, you know, basically, you know, we basically, this captures all of the data from all of the trade partners, you know, and we know that because when we add up all things, we get the total value of Canadian imports. So if a country isn't here, the value is zero. So, so that's fine for the trade, the trade data. Now, one slight problem is, um, you know, what, what tariff rate should we assign to that country? Uh, with the zero uh, exports to Canada. That's going to matter for the econometrics because even if there's zero trade flows, we still need to assign it a tariff 
if we want to include it on, in, our, in our regressions. So what we do there is you can see that the tariff rates, you know, there's the total duty, but the duty is disaggregated into dutyable under, if, if, the, if the data, if the imports are coming in under the preferential British rate, if it's coming in under a tr trade treaty rate, or if it's coming in under a general rate, everybody else. And what you can see is that then, you know, for, you know, for these three trade policy regimes, you get a total value of imports and a total duty. And so what you can do is you can calculate an average preferential duty, an average trade treaty duty, and an average general duty. And so, you know, what we can do then, imagine for walnuts, France isn't ex is not exporting walnuts to Canada in a particular year. Okay. But we, you know, we know that what the general tariff rate is for walnuts, we know what the preferential rate is and the treaty rate, you know, so because France had a trade treaty with, uh, with Canada, we know that it's eligible for the treaty rate and it's not eligible for the British rate because it's not British. And so we give it the trade treaty rate. So that involved a bit of fiddling, but that's the best that we can do. Okay. Some um, general, general sort of summary statistics. The US is the biggest uh, trade partner on the import side, but you can see that its, its trade share falls rather dramatically over the course of this period. Brits are number two, their trade share rises. And then we have also goods from the rest of the empire and from, from foreign countries. Uh, in terms of the big important sectors, uh, iron and steel, other minerals, including petroleum and, uh, and coal and so on, and textiles are a big one, okay? Um, average tariffs. So there's a clear hierarchy. So at the bottom, the Brits get the lowest tariffs, then comes the rest of the empire, then comes foreign countries, and then comes the USA, which doesn't have the most favored nation deal. And then they only bridge that gap with other foreign countries in 36, which is when they do have the most favored nation. You can see tariffs going up after 1929 for everybody, but then for the Brits, you know, they start coming down pretty quickly after 1931. They only start coming down uh, you know, after 33. For, for, for foreign countries. Um, there's a lot of variation across sectors. You know, for, for fiber, for example, the British face higher tariffs, whereas for, you know, whereas, whereas, you know for, for plant products, you know, the British tariff goes up and then goes down. You know, there's a lot of variation across countries, across goods, which is good for uh, estimating elasticities. Okay, so how do we estimate these? Briefly, because this is, you know, I, I need to watch the time. I have about 23 minutes left or something. And it's not a trade audience, but but briefly. What I like about trade, I have to say, uh, and this is maybe portraying my age, is they are very much into structural econometrics. You know, uh, it's not sort of you do a diff and diff and let's think about whether this makes any theoretical sense later. You know, they, they start with a theory. And that's because if you don't start with a theory, and you run a gravity regression, you'll get garbage results essentially. So there've been several famous papers showing this. So what you're trying to explain is the nominal value of imports of good G from country C in year T, okay? And the basic structural gravity equation, which is theory-based, comes out of a lot of theoretical frameworks. It makes perfect sense. You know, so imports of cars from the US in 1930, okay? What should that be related to? It should be related to total imports of cars from all countries in 1930. That makes sense, right? It should be related to, what is this term here, the Ys? It's, this is Ys output, so it's, it's American output of cars in 1930 as a share of world output of cars in 1930, right? So uh, Canadian imports of cars from America in, in a year should be proportional to America's share of car production in that year, okay? And that's what, that's what Canadian imports would be. It would just be the product of these two terms if there were no trade costs, but then there are trade costs. And so you have the third term here in the curly brackets. So this sigma term, this is great, gonna be greater than one, uh, which means that if the numerator of this expression goes up, uh, Canadian uh, imports from that country fall. Okay, so this tau here, it's basically in the context of Canada, it's well, it's 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 the ad valorem tariff, okay, that Canada, Canada is imposing on, on on cars from Canada in year T. So if the tariff goes up, then the import should fall. That makes sense. 
but it's a relative trade cost. So in the denominator here, you've got PGT is everything that makes it costly to import cars into Canada in that year. So that's what's known as an inward multilateral resistance term. And then the PI term here, it's everything that makes it expensive to export cars from the US in 1930. That's known as an outward multilateral resistance term. Okay, so that's what you should be estimating. And um, basically what, how, how so, so you, can, you can of course observe, well, you can hope, certainly observe the policy variable. And then, you know, you have these terms here. You, you probably observe total imports of cars. We observe that also. What about American share of car production? And what about these multilateral resistance terms? Well, if you had a full bilateral matrix of trade, so it's a trade between cars between all of our countries, you know, France to Britain, Canada to the US, US to Canada, okay, then your data set would be of dimension uh, country, country, product, year, okay? And so what you could do is you could have product, country, year dummies. You know, you have enough dimensionality to do that. And that would get rid of this term, it would get rid of this term, it would get rid of this term. And, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about these multilateral resistances. Because we only have imports coming into Canada, you know, the dimensionality of our data set is product country year. And if your dimensionality is product country year, you pretty obviously can't put in product country year dummies. And so we're stuck. Uh, and so what do we do? We run regressions of this form. So we have our imports of good G from country C of year T as a function of the, the tariff rate. And then we have a bunch of dummy variables. So we have good times country dummy variables. So for example, an American car dummy variable. So that's gonna kind of control for everything that makes America good at exporting cars to uh, Canada. It uh, also controls for every country uh, time invariant variable, every good time invariant variable. And it ensures that identification occurs along the time dimension for those of you who can care about that sort of thing, which you probably should. We have good times time dummy variables. So, you know, we're controlling for imports of cars in 1930, 31, 32. So that's gonna account for ships and Canadian uh, import demand between different types of goods. It's gonna uh, control for uh, uh, shifts in, you know, supply. If the world supply of cars goes up, you know, you're, you're controlling for that. And in the context of the earlier equation, G, pi or phi GT is going to control for, it's going to control for this PGT, the Canadian Inward Multilateral Resistance Term. So we're good on that. We've controlled for that, but we haven't controlled for this pi GCT. How are we going to do that? Okay. Uh, we can't put in dummy variables that are good times country times year, but our 1700 goods, we can divide them into 99 industries. I. And so we can, you know, put in industry, country, time, fixed effects, and that's going to control for a ton of stuff, you know, and it's not only going to control for industry stuff that's varying by country and year, you're also controlling for everything that's varying by country and year. So exchange rates, GDP, trade deals, etc. So we don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Okay. And then finally, we're going to directly control for those outward multilateral resistance current terms that need to vary by good country year that are the, the problem that we're facing. So we're going to try to estimate those things, and we're going to then directly stick those into the equations. So we're doing as best we can. Okay, so to, to control for these OMRs, you know, which have to vary by country good year, how do we do that? Well, I go, again, we go to theory. Theory says that these outward multilateral resistances good country year are related to inward multilateral resistances that vary by good and country and year. J here is indexing, indexing countries also. And that these inward multilateral resistances are a linear combination of the, uh, of the outward multilateral resistances. So that's just what theory says should be the case. So this is a system of equations uh, where you're going across all goods, all countries, all countries and all years. And so if you know, uh, well, what do you need to know these things, the E's, the Y's, and the T's. And if you know what these things are, then you can solve for the whole system and you can back out the OMRs, okay? So what are the T's? The T's are trade costs 
which are good specific between country C and country J in year T. That's what we really need. We need to extract good specific trade costs between each pair of countries in our data set, all 112 of them. Okay, so these have to be bilateral between all goods or between all countries, and we have to do them good specific. So how do we do that? That's going to be the, the problem we face. So again, theory tells us that these trade costs should be a function of anything that might affect trade costs between countries by good, which could be distance, could be common language, could be trade barriers, could be whatever you like. They, they should be good specific. They should, you know, they should vary between countries and they should be time varying also. Okay, so these are, for example, distance, and then the, the trade cost should be distance multiplied by some distance elasticity. So that's what your trade cost should be. So what we can do is we can, you know, get data on a, you know, a vector of, uh, uh, of, of variables that affect trade costs between all of our countries. Okay, now these trade costs, you know, the, these, trade, these trade cost variables, they should vary by good, but we don't have that. We have things like distance, we have common language, we have common empire membership. They should all matter for trade costs, okay? They're, but we don't have them varying by good. So how do we get the good dimension into it? Well, what we do is we run regressions explaining trade flows where we let the coefficients be good specific. And so then we have a good specific coefficient multiplying say distance between C and J, which is obviously invariant across time. And we're gonna get then a trade cost. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do, okay? So we're going to uh, estimate uh, regressions like this, where our data are our Canadian import data. So we have, we're going to run regressions where we have imports into Canada of goods G, country C, year T, as a function of you know distance to country C, language, common language, country C, membership of, com of, a, common, of a common empire block, which varies by time, uh, and GDP in year C. And then we're going to let these coefficients be good, be country specific, be good specific. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Okay, and then we're going to use that then to uh, estimate these trade costs, which is what we ultimately want. Okay, so now one problem is if we're estimating these things at the good level, we don't have a lot of observations. And so not all of the observations will be estimable and not all will be correctly signed. So we try it first at the good level. If it doesn't work, then we run it at the 99 industry level, and uh, you know we use those coefficients. If that doesn't work, then we run it at the the, the 10 sector level. Uh, if that doesn't work, we run it for all goods, and we use our, our coefficient estimates. And so, yeah, and I mean, this is what our sectoral gravity estimates look like. This is not, you know, we're only doing this, remember, to calculate those outward multilateral resistances for no other purpose, but the, you know, the, the coefficients look reasonable enough. So. Distances are always negatively related to trade. The the uh, the coefficients are on the large side, larger than today. You know, which maybe makes sense. Maybe distance mattered more then. Language doesn't matter. Empire membership does matter. Okay. So having done that, we then construct our T's, and then finally we estimate our our equation, which is at the bottom of that screen. So that's what we really want to do. And what we really are interested in is the coefficient on the tariff rate because that gives us our sigma elasticity that we can then plug back into the model, okay? So this is all quite a lot of work, but anyway, this, these are our estimates of our sigmas then. The coefficient on the tariff is our estimates of the sigmas, the elasticity of substitution between different national varieties of particular products. So it's averaging out at about 3.7 in absolute terms, okay? And uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty robust. Uh, OLS, you shouldn't do, you should do PPML. But the, you know, for theoretical reasons, but you know, and we do it for different, uh, different samples. We we exclude zero trade flows. We, for reasons I don't have time to go into, look only at specific tariffs, or 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 we exclude goods with specific tariffs. It's pretty robust. Okay, what we're going to use uh, in our baseline results is we're going to use uh, estimates of sigmas that vary not by good. But by by in by sector. Oh, sorry, uh, not there yet. This is showing you. Sorry, this is showing you that the UK elasticity is higher, suggesting that exports of British goods to Canada are more price sensitive for some reason. This is showing you that the elasticity got smaller in absolute terms during the Great Depression, which may be interesting. 
Um, this is what we're going to use for the base case simulations. We're going to let the sigmas vary by broad sector, of which we have 10. Uh, the, 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 the coefficients should be negative, and they are, except for one case. Okay, what do we do with this? Well, we do for this what we do with all of them, which is we're going to run simulations where we're going to let stick stick the sigmas into our model, but these sigmas were estimated without, uh, you know, econometrically, and so they're estimated with error. And so every time we do a counterfactual, we're actually going to do a thousand counterfactuals. We take a thousand draws from these distributions, and that allows us to plot something like error bands around our simulation results. Um, and so what we do here is, you know, we just say, uh, well, we do what we do here, everywhere here, which is we, we run a thousand draws. This is the mean of the distribution. This is the sort of standard distribution of the uh, standard error of the distribution. And if the draw is negative, is, is got the wrong sign, we can explain it to be zero. And we do the same for all of these also. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Okay, so now we're finally getting to the counterfactuals. So a lot of work to get there. So just to remind you, what we're doing here is we're saying, what is the impact on Canadian imports if of, of tariff changes after 1929? And so we're asking what would tariffs have, what would imports have been like in 1929 if we had imposed on the 1929 economy later years tariffs, okay? And so what we're doing is we're plotting the median estimate. This should be the median, not the mean, so that's a typo. And we're uh, imposing sort of these, you know, fifth, you know, fifth and 95th percentiles and similarly for 25th and 75th. That's because these elasticities were estimated econometrically, right? So the mean impact is maybe 4%. So it's saying that, you know, tariffs are maybe suppressing Canadian imports by 4%, which is not enormous, actually. And those error bands, quote unquote, are pretty wide. That's because those error bands are largely depending on that upper level, you know, the impact on total imports largely depends on that upper level kappa elasticity I highlighted earlier. And I remember I told you that the you know, standard error was, was about 0.5 which is you know, reasonably big. And so you're getting quite you know, big dispersion of those elasticity draws and so a big dispersion of the counterfactual simulations. Anyway, the, the effect is fairly small. When you look at the impact of exports to Canada from different countries, we see var variation there. So as you predict, probably these tariff changes boost imports from U U UK by about five, 6%. They lower US imports, similar margin. They lower imports from the empire by a similar margin. The biggest effect is non-American foreign countries where uh, imports are maybe being by lowered by 8% or something. Okay. Why are the British imports going up? Is it, is it because the Brits are facing lower tariffs? And the answer is no. Uh, here we have two simulation results without the error bands to keep it simple. So the top line is what I already showed you. It's what's the impact on British exports to Canada of all the tariff changes after 1929. So as you can see, they're raising uh, British exports to Canada by about 6% in 1932-33. So that's basically this result here without the error bands. The red line is what is what would have been the impact on British exports to Canada if you had changed only tariffs facing British exports and you'd left everybody else's tariffs unchanged. And what you can see is that under that scenario, British imports to Canada would actually have declined. And that's because the Canadians, they raised on average, on average, they raised tariffs facing British goods being com coming into Canada. They raised them. So that's going to lower your exports to Canada. So why are their imports actually going up as a result of all of the tariff changes? It's because British exporters faced higher tariffs, but everybody else faced even higher tariffs. So it's all about the discrimination and not at all about the level of protection, okay? Here's the impact on, on, on American imports. Again, it's about you know, five, 6%, pretty small. The country that seems to get walloped is Japan. So uh, Canadian tariff changes are lowering Canada, uh, Japanese exports to Canada by about 10% by 1931, and it gets bigger and bigger. And by 1936, uh, they're, they're being reduced by about a fifth which is a pretty big effect. And this is something that we've been finding pretty systematically. The Japanese are one way or another being singled out for special uh, uh, consideration by lots of countries during this period with, with potential consequences. 
politically in Tokyo, as, as we know. Okay, this is just making the point that it's important to look at the, the disaggregated data. So, so iron exports from Britain to Canada are increasing as a result of changes in Canadian protection. On the other hand, UK textile exports to Canada are falling, right? And that's because, you know, it, it was on an earlier slide, actually, you know, the, the textile uh, tariff rates facing British exporters are, are going up a lot, you know, where, which was not the case for, for ironware, you know. So, so there is, you know, domestic Canadian stuff going on that's hitting or benefiting sectors, even in Britain, you know, rather differently, depending on what good you're considering. And you miss all of that if you look at aggregate data. So these results are small. This was a corresponding figure from the Indian paper. It was showing you that basically UK exports to Canada were being boosted by almost a quarter, as opposed to, uh, sorry, UK exports to India were being boosted by almost a quarter, as opposed to only 6% for Canada. So why the difference? Is it because of you know, different elasticities that we're estimating? No, not particularly. Uh, it's because the shock was different. You know, so this blue line here, so the, 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 the gray line there is the average Indian tariff rate. And you can see that something very dramatic happens after 1931. This is the average British tariff rate, big shock. This is the average, the blue line is the average Canadian tariff rate. It goes up after 1930, but not by that much actually. It had always been pretty high, it gets a little higher, okay? But it had always been pretty high and it had always been discriminating against Britain. So that suggests then a second set of counterfactuals, what's the impact of the total uh, structure of protection on Canadian imports? So what we do here is we have our models, our 13 models of the Canadian economy for each year from 1924 to 36. And we say, what is the impact uh, of protection compared to a free trade counterfactual? So in each year we say, you know, what's, what would imports have looked like if you know Canadian tariffs have just been zero across the board, compare that with the actual scenario. So what's the impact on total imports of the actual protection? And what you can see is you're getting fairly sizable effects now. You know the actual, you know the total structure of protection is is raising is is reducing Canadian imports by you know maybe 15 percent, 14, 15 percent, going up to 16, 17 percent after the depression. Again, with those fairly big uh, error bars. What's it doing to imports from the UK? Okay, interestingly, despite preferential treatment, you know, Canada was so protectionist that actually for most of this period, its total structure of protection was lowering UK exports to Canada. And then what happens after the depression is you eventually get back to a situation of neutrality where the total structure of protection is neither depressing nor raising uh, UK exports to Canada relative to a free trade counterfactual. But how do you get back to neutrality and it's basically through a combination of higher protection and increasing discrimination. So it's really quite distortionary, their tariff schedule. You know, the Americans, they'd always been, you know, losing out quite a lot, and they lose out by even more. Uh, and foreign countries are losing out, you know, by about 20%. So systematically, there's the, you know, the, Canada had always been a pretty protectionist country, and actually that was suppressing imports from the rest of the world by quite a lot. It's the, it's the change in imports after the Great Depression that is modest, not the total structure of protection. So in conclusion, and I think I'm just about on time, uh, yes, Canadian policy after 1929 lowered imports. It tilted trade away from the US uh, and other foreign countries towards uh, the UK. But these effects of these changes in policy uh, were modest, and they reflect the fact that the shock itself was relatively modest, you know? So a sort of a, a methodological point, if you had tried to look at the impact of the Ottawa trade agreements between all of these dominions and India, looking at bilateral trade between these countries and having a trade block dummy that switched on in July of 1932, you know, you would have missed that. You would have estimated an average effect, you know, and you'd have missed the fact that, it, you know, it was a big deal for India and not a big deal for Canada. And the reason that it was a big deal for India and not for Canada is that the shocks involved were very different. You know, the Canadians already had been protecting a lot and discriminating significantly. Okay. The overall structure of protection in Canada was pretty distortionary and pretty protectionist. It only became more so after the Great Depression. And if we look finally at what the impact was on Britain, 
yes, it ends up benefiting Britain, but it's not because of lower uh, tariffs. It's completely because of discrimination between you know, favoring Britain and disfavoring other countries. And again, what that suggests is if you try to look at the impact of protection by, for example, estimating an import demand curve in a partial equilibrium way and looking at the impact of tariffs, well, higher tariffs will always lead to lower imports. That's, you know, that's what you're going to find. But you'd be missing completely the story here because, yes, British Britain faced higher tariffs. Yes, on their own, that suppressed, suppressed their exports to, to Canada. But overall, they benefited. And that's because this margin of protection was increasing. So, so that's it. We, we think that uh, our results show that it's actually worthwhile doing the hard yards to get the, uh, the, uh, the fine-grained disaggregated data on trade and trade policy, because otherwise you basically don't understand what's going on, we think. Okay, that's it. I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, so, so for now, uh, let's just uh, invite Steve to uh, give his comments to Kevin's paper. So, Steve, are you are you there? Okay, here we go. Sorry, I needed to uh, unmute. Um, so, I need to share screen now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, um, Kevin. That's uh, an excellent presentation. Um, and um, just to sort of <laughs> briefly summarize then, the, the, the paper's asking if the post-1929 changes in trade policy culminating in the Imperial Economic Conference of 1932 had a significant impact on Canadian imports. And uh, as uh, Kevin said, it's part of a wider project using highly disaggregated data on trade flows and tariffs to reassess the impact of interwar protection. And it includes two papers which Kevin referred to um, on uh, the UK um, and uh, another one on India. And if you put together these three papers, then you're getting a particular focus on the extent to which Brit the British Empire was able to defy gravity by fostering trade links between countries which were you know, very far apart. Uh, and th this came at the expense of trade with neighbours. So uh, I have a graph here which shows you, you know, the impact of this in the, in the first half of the 20th century is absolutely enormous. So this graph shows you the share of UK exports going to uh, empire countries. That's the blue line. And then um, the orange line is um, an official term, British countries, um, because some countries left the empire, remained in, and, and up. <clears throat> they're, they're sort of included in the definition of British countries. But you can see very much the case that, um, let's say, in the um, most of the 19th century, the uh, empire share of UK exports was about 30%. By the 1940s, sorry, by the 1920s, it had risen to 40%. And by the 1940s, it's, it's, it's going above 50%. Uh, and you can see the, you know, this, why I called it defying gravity is that the, the gray line here is what's happening to British exports to the original EEC six countries. It was very close, um, and uh, Britain is moving away from trading with Europe towards trading with uh, more distant countries. So if you like, it's the Brexit before Brexit, um, and uh, th this is very much defying gravity. You can see here it's, it's a rather large effect then. Um, so coming on to the C Canadian results, which Kevin has just shown you, I can just briefly summarize. Um, the, the first thing is the overall impact of the post-1929 tariff shifts um, is relatively small, about 4%. Uh, that should be the median effect. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and that's around about 1932. And it's, it's a small effect because Canada 
was already a highly protectionist country, uh, as Kevin said. Um, again, as Kevin said, the overall effects were much larger for the UK and India, uh, and for the reasons which uh, he explained. So I won't, uh, won't. I'll be very brief here. Just uh, in Canada, the blue line. There's not much of an increase in tariffs because they're they're starting from an already high level, the increases are much bigger in uh, Britain and India. Um, and then there's the finally the, the free trade counterfactual. Although the impact um, of the increase in tariffs after 1929 is quite small in Canada, the median effect is, 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 is somewhat larger compared with a uh, counterfactual of uh, no protection. And that's a, a decline of around 17% at the peak, I think. So, um, yeah, I, I, I agree with both the specific Canadian findings and also the general finding that the British Empire was able to sustain gravity-defying long-distance trading links at the expense of trading with the nearer neighbours in Europe. I think what was less clear to me uh, is the extent to which you have to go to the lengths of uh, finding data on 1,697 products and um, a and very large number of uh, countries. So, um, and in the Canadian, Canadian case, I think I would like to see a comparison with the results of David Jacks' 2014 paper in Explorations. So, um, Kevin's paper, I, I've called it the Lorry paper, that's uh, Lamper, O'Rourke, Reiter, and Yotov. Um, they're working with big data. 1,697 goods, 112 countries, and they're, they're using annual data, which I think is, is the right level, actually. But Jax works with 10 product groups or sectors. Those are the same 10 sectors for which Kevin presented the, the, the results, really. Um, it's looking at the top 10 countries in each sector rather than loading up all the data for all countries. Um, uh, but they actually disaggregate a bit further by, by using quarterly data. Um, so I can see some advantages of working with JAX's uh, data set. It seems to be more manageable. If you want to track what's happening, you can do that in a single table or a single chart with 10 product groups in a way that you can't with 1,697 products. Um, and, and, and as I say, um, in fact, you know, Kevin presented the results generally in, speak, in terms of the 10 sectors that Jack's used and the four country groups that uh, he used as well. Um, I, I was trying to construct a, a comparison, a direct comparison myself. And, and the closest I could come to it from the paper was um, this, which is, is, is over on the left-hand side, you see um, the uh, rise in, um, in imports for the UK, a decline for the US, um, and um, for the rest of the empire, this is an increase to start with, and then a, then a decline. Um, and then for um, the other foreign countries, uh, is it, a big decline. Uh, we don't get exactly the same information from Jax's paper, but because this is the import shares um, rather than the, 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 the level of imports. But you can see very much the same thing, that the, the top line is, is what's happening uh, in the United States, and it's, it, it, it trends down. So they, they bear the, the brunt of the increase in um, import share from, from, from the UK. That's the solid gray line. Um, there's slightly different trends here in the... Um, in the uh, the empire, the rest of the empire is the dotted line, and the rest of the world. But that's I think because they're shares rather than um, the, the level of imports. So I think we're basically getting the same story there. Um, so um, 
I think we, we basically can get the same kind of results by working with 10 sectors and four country groups. Um, and the problem with working with such a, a low level of aggregation is that you, you, you don't have any other variables uh, for the econometric work at that kind of level of disaggregation. I think maybe that's partly what's causing the, the need for the novel method of controlling for multilateral resistances. Um, also worth bearing in mind, classification errors can sometimes be worse at very low levels of aggregation, and you can avoid it by aggregating um, into broader categories. And in, indeed, that that you know, Kevin is, is sometimes doing here, really, by um, noting that when there's the wrong sign comes up, you then move up to a higher level of aggregation and use that. The counterfactuals, um, um, the, the two other papers on the UK and India evaluate the impact of the shift in trade policy during the 1930s by asking what would imports have been in the different years, 1930, 31, 32, and so on, with tariffs held at their 1929 level. For some reason, in this paper, um, things have been turned around and um, they're asking what would the imports have been in 1929 with the tariffs of the later years? I mean, I'm not sure why why you've done that. Uh, and it, it seems to get in the way of, of direct comparisons. I also uh, am slightly worried from previous experience with index number problems <laughs> that, that you're going to get exactly the same results using the two approaches. I'll finally to um, raise the issue of um, tariff and exchange rate changes. I, I think exchange rate changes really complicate the evaluation of the tariff changes in the interwar period, um, which I first ran into working on my um, uh, PhD thesis when I worked on interwar policy in Britain. Um, so, you know, to the extent that tariff changes succeed in decreasing imports, then that should improve the trade balance, but that should then appreciate the exchange rate if the exchange rate is floating, and then that would in turn e increase imports. So this is sort of offsetting. And um, well, Canada has an interesting uh, history of its exchange rate policy in the interwar period. It actually left gold in 1929, um, two years before Britain uh, in 1931. So at the time these um, Great Depression tariff changes are coming in, uh, the, the, the exchange rate is floating uh, in, in Canada. And um, I think throughout the interwar period, the um, I think the exchange rate is, is actually probably playing a bigger role in affecting output and unemployment than than the tariffs so in in the british case um, we've already seen that the move to imperial integration is quite important in the 1920s but actually britain has a bad 1920s um, with very high unemployment and, and that's because they overvalue the exchange rate and then in the 1930s we get into the uh, eichen green and Sachs story of coming off gold and uh, and helping recovery. So I think something discussion of the um, exchange rates, you know, really needs to complement the the work on on the tariffs. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Yeah. Um. Thank you, Steve. Um. Kevin, do you want to just give a quick response to to Steve's comments, or shall we just move on to the to the next session? Yeah, maybe I no, guess quick, very quickly. So, so the big data uh, point is well taken. I think I think for this paper, yeah, I mean David uh, didn't run his regressions the way that you know structural gravity said you should, and it was aggregated data, and we basically get very similar results to him. You know, so you're right. Um, but for the British paper, uh, we didn't find that, and actually the editor in the journal we were dealing with, I mean, uh, the, the final hoop she made us. Uh, jump through where she said, okay, now you have your disaggregated data, 
but now aggregate to this level and this level and replicate the analysis and see if the results get bigger or smaller. And, and actually we found that for there, actually the more aggregated the level we operated at, the smaller the results. But there the result was that it was big, you know, so, so I suppose maybe if, <laughs> if, if there is a big result to be found, you're more likely to find it if it's aggregated, but if it's small, well then yeah, uh, aggregated is fine. So um, I, I, yeah, your point in counterfactuals is very well taken and maybe that's one. So do you want to take, do it for this paper? I don't know, but, but for sure, so ultimately you'd like there to be a book. And I suppose that could be the, that could be the excuse, the occasion to make everything coherent, you know, I suppose. And that would be, I think you're absolutely yeah. right there. And well, I mean, the I mean, it, it's presentational, but your, your point about the index numbers is more worrying. So yeah, no, for sure. We'll deal with that at some point. And then finally, on the um, exchange rates, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm sure it mattered a lot for trade flows during this period. So maybe maybe the, you could say this is an argument for how we're doing the counterfactual, because what we're doing is we're saying, in 1929, given their endowments, given their structure of demand and everything else, just give it different years trade policy variables and see how things adjust. So in a sense, the counterfactual is going to, in a sense, is stripping out the exchange rate things. So maybe that's an argument for why you're you're doing it um, that way. Now, a more challenging take on this now is because um, you know I have a paper with Martin Ellis and your colleague, you know, on, on on leaving the gold standard, you know, and we found that it had a big effect through changing price inflation expectations, this kind of thing. But that does, you know, remind us that this is a period of unemployment, and you know. Our trade model is just a standard trade model. It's a full employment trade model, you know. And so, uh, if the tariff changes would have led to, ch to changes in uh, employment, then that would be a sort of a meta objection to these exercises that we're doing to the counterfactuals. But I'm just not sure. I mean, now one trade guy I gave, I was at a seminar, and he said, "Well, look, you know, you're saying your results are holding GDP constant at a, at a, at a given level, you know." And you know, and what and what else can you do? But it is a potential objection. So, in a sense, if exchange rates matter more for unemployment than tariffs, then I'd be happy with that. Probably. Anyway, thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And um, so let's now just move on to the Q and A part. Um, I think one of the questions asks about the um, presentation slides. So, just to um, just to say, uh, we uh, this talk will be will be uh, record it is recorded and will work on YouTube later on in the couple of days. So, uh, if you want to uh, have an analog of the, the slides, you, you may you may check it out on on YouTube later. Um, I'm, happy, I'm happy to share the slides if people want the slides. I don't know if on your website the slides can be uploaded or whatever. Yeah, anyway, I, I think we can, we can, yeah we can figure it out later. Uh, um, another question from the audience is asking, uh, how come we cannot see the effect of the 1935 uh, MFN treaty in your USA specific graph? And speaking of the very last graph slide, just uh, before this is out, maybe I interpreted it wrong. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, great question, Guillaume. Uh, and I'm looking at um. I'm, I'm looking back at my slides now, of course, <laughs> trying to trying to convince myself whether it's true or not. So, yeah, um, yeah. Well, if I look at if I if I look at nineteen actually if I look at um, if I look at the just the impact on, on 1929 imports of imposing later years tariffs. I mean, I do see that the total impact on the U.S. is less negative in 1936. Than it had been in 1935 or 1934. On the other hand, it had already been declining. So, um, so it's not clear to me. Yeah, uh, but it, it's good. I, I agree. I think again, same 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 question answer as to Stephen. Away, if we ever do a book on all of this, I think it'd be a chance to maybe dig you know into those rather specific questions deeper. But thank you, Guillaume. Okay, so I see Debbie pops up. Debbie, do you want to give, give me a question? Quick question? Yeah, no, sure. again, very interesting presentation. So I'm asking questions a little bit. You can hear me okay, right? So one thing that was quite interesting, you mentioned Japan actually at the beginning as well. There was a big drop for, for that. 
And I wonder, you know, if you know this is a very interesting period to some degree. And sort of following along that, I think Steve mentioned exchange rates. One thing I will be quite curious is when you increase tariff, especially for countries with you know, fact endowment uh, were quite similar, you, you will see actually foreign direct investment that will follow. And that's to some degree what was happening in Japan when Chinese tariff roads, some of the cotton manufacturer uh, in Japan were moving into Shanghai and Qingdao and so on. So I wonder how you, I mean, the general part, how you account for the the rise tariff causing flow of the capital management. Uh, it's another great question. And I, I don't, is, is the simple answer. And it's not beyond the, I mean, if you, if somebody were to tell me that there had been tariff hopping foreign investment from either America or Britain into the Canadian market in the 1930s, yeah, I would say, yeah, that sounds that sounds plausible. All right. I mean, I, um, so does it affect our results? I mean, I suppose potentially the tariff hopping uh, stuff might affect GDP in the context of our model. You know, I mean, in a sense. In a sense, our trade elasticities are capturing the total effect on all of the trade flows, you know, that might be partly due to tariff hopping and might partly be due to other things. So, you know, you might say that our trade elasticities aren't just trade elasticities, but trade come other uh, FDI type effect, you know. So that would be the cheap and cheerful way of saying, well, we're, we're dealing with it somehow. But, but oh. it, clearly we're missing yeah. an important part well, of the story, bigger yeah, story. For sure. Well, foreign direct yeah. investment may take much longer than the period. For, for sure. Time. And, you know, one thing that I'm thinking uh, for future research is we've got all these data, you know, and all we've been doing now is looking at just trade impacts. But, I mean, there's got to be a big agenda looking at other yeah. impacts as well. Because, again, it's understudy. Everybody says they were a disaster, these tariffs. But it's not clear, you know, the, you know Clemens and Williamson say, well, maybe it actually low, it raised raise growth. I mean, you know, it, it's theoretically unclear what their impact would have been in a depression environment. So maybe getting up, using detailed information to ask questions about impacts of the real economy would be a good way to go, I think. Thanks. Okay, so, we, yeah, we still have a time for, 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 for this question from Catherine. So may, that, may I ask uh, how, whether uh, is relevant to ask about smuggling. Um, yes, yeah, a long question, and yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it to you to to read. Yeah, um, it's another good question, and for sure, it's got a very long land border, doesn't it? So, if there's any smuggling, it's going to be the, with the U.S. We know that there was a lot of smuggling during the 1920s, going in the other direction, don't we? Because of prohibition. So, uh, yeah. There's nothing we can do about it, basically. Um, and I wonder whether we should, yeah, I wonder whether we shouldn't do a little bit of reading to at least acknowledge the issue. Okay, so um, I think we're, we're just about the time to, to finish today's uh, event. Um, so, yeah, um, thank you very much again, uh, Kevin, for giving us this lovely talk and also Thanks our discussant, uh, Professor Stephen Burberry and also Professor Debbie Ma uh, to be with us here today. And also thanks, a big thanks to all our audience online. Um, so just a quick announcement for the next event. So on the 11th April, we will have Professor Zhu Chen uh, to give another talk on uh, war and the origins of Chinese civilization uh, on this platform. So yes, yeah, so just, just keep a note down on this date and, and the title. Yeah, so again, thanks everyone for joining us uh, today. And uh, it's, it's really lovely to, to uh, listen to this talk. And yeah, thanks everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks to everyone.